Did you consent to a search? Did you consent? He can retract his, he can retract that at any time. He can retract that at any time. He can retract it. I don't give a f what you need. What's up, you guys? Welcome back to Southern Draw Law. My name is James White, criminal defense attorney, former prosecutor, former police officer. Have you ever been stopped for a traffic violation and been asked for consent to search your vehicle by the officer who stopped you? Well, you may or may not know this, but it's pretty common practice for police officers to ask for consent to search a motorist's vehicle during a traffic stop. The question is, is it a violation of a person's constitutional rights for the police to ask for consent to search the vehicle? And more importantly, do you have to allow a police officer to search your vehicle simply because they asked? The short answer is no to both questions. It does not violate the Constitution for an officer to ask for consent to search, but a motorist also has no obligation to grant said consent simply because an officer asked. The problem is, like anything else, a lot of people just don't really know that. They think that doing whatever the police ask you to do is just part of compliance, and they fear the negative consequences, reasonably, of telling a police officer no. Because of this, one of the necessary services First Amendment auditors and cop watchers provide is that they inform people, sometimes in the middle of the actual search, that they don't have to allow the police to search their vehicle. And that's what happened in the video we're about to watch. So our video today comes to us from the YouTube channel East TN Police Stories, and it features a Knoxville, Tennessee-based auditor slash cop watcher named Tyler Givens. And in the video, Tyler is doing exactly what we just discussed. He noticed the police conducting a traffic stop and decided to film it. When he noticed that the motorist was having their vehicle searched, he decides to try to help. Now, I've made a few edits to the video to cut out some of the dead space, but I encourage you to head over to Tyler's channel and give him credit for the work he's doing and for sharing the video. Let's watch. So I stopped it pretty early here because I want to draw your attention to one part of the video. So the video starts with what looks like a pat down that is probably consensual, I'm guessing, although we don't know for sure. The driver's body language suggests to me that he didn't oppose the pat down and it might be just because he thought that was part of the process and that he had to comply. But more than likely, and I am speculating, but I'm doing so based on my experience, the officer asked him to step out and then said something that was along the lines of, hey man, do you mind if I pat you down real quick and make sure you don't have any weapons? And he didn't say no. Now, these two officers are both canine officers. So the main thing they're doing at this point is to try to separate him from the vehicle which a normal police officer would do too, but specifically canine officers want to do that because a lot of departments have a policy that nobody can be in or around the vehicle when they run the dog around. So they're basically setting up a canine sweep in their approach to removing him from the car. So shortly after they get the motorist to the front of their cruisers, you can see that they are asking him questions. One of the officers is writing down information on a notepad and then based on what the driver is doing and what you hear, it seems like their questions are like itinerary questions. These are things like, hey, where are you headed? Where are you coming from? What brings you to the area? Now, to be clear, there is no law anywhere suggesting that people have to answer these questions. In fact, it's a terrible idea and no one should ever do it. But for whatever reason, this guy wants to be cooperative, probably because he's seen, you know, people die at the hands of police and he wants to just get on with his day. But at some point, the motorist responds to some question that the officer asked and he says, hey, just go ahead. 
Now, this is voluntary consent because the officer then goes to try to search the vehicles. You can see by the body language of the driver that his intention is to convey the fact that he's not concerned about what the police might find in his vehicle. He wants the officers to know that he has nothing to hide. And so he says, go ahead, in a very carefree way. Now, the officer approaches the vehicle to find that the door is locked, and the guy says, my fault, and opens the door for the officer. This is, again, reinforcing his voluntary consent. Let's watch some more. Did you consent to a search? Did you consent? Hey, Richie. Richie. I didn't consent to no search. Yeah. No, I didn't. Uh -huh. He can retract his. He can retract that at any time. He can retract that at any time. He can retract it. I don't give a f what you need. I'm good right here. Don't come any closer. You know what? Here, I just took two steps closer. I know. Don't be fucking searching somebody's car when you're not supposed to be searching it, man. You tricked him into that. I'm just nervous because I'm not from out here, okay? Yeah, of course he is. So it sounds like they pulled him over for expired registration on his North Carolina plates and then guy tried to search his car. It's, uh, shit. To check the time. Okay, so you may have noticed that a funny thing happened there. The cops basically gave up. They did what they were supposed to do to finish the stop, and then they just let the guy go. So the stop happened in November of 2023. The plates were apparently expired since, like, July of 2023, and he got no ticket, no written warning, nothing, just a verbal warning, and got to go. So that should tell you a couple things. First thing it should tell you is that they were just fishing and looking for dope, which is not a surprise from a canine cop. But the second thing it should tell you about this interaction is that the officer's entire approach to this stop changed once they realized they were being filmed by an auditor or cop watcher, however you want to categorize him. Now, you might say that, you know, officers are filmed all the time because they have body cams and, you know, what's another camera? No big deal. But the difference is that they know that their department is in control of the body cam. And they also know that only the auditor or cop watcher is in control of their camera unless they cross the line and do something illegal and seize it for some reason. So they know that as long as they don't flag the footage at their department, nobody's ever really going to know about this. But a third party camera, will very likely end up on YouTube or some social media and it's within somebody else's control if and when that happens. But this is an interesting case because it gives us an opportunity to explore a couple concepts. First, it shows us what good auditing work looks like. I mean, Tyler engages where he thinks it's necessary, but he doesn't harass the officers. He's not being provocative. He's striking a balance between doing good auditing and poking the bear just enough. He definitely takes no crap from them 
and he blows off their unlawful directives about how close he can be. And he even takes a couple steps forward and says, look, I'm going to stand a couple steps forward. And then he lets them know he's not going to back down. But until they engaged him, he didn't do that. The other and most important thing this brings up for the purposes of our discussion is consent. So we understand that you don't have to give consent, but once you give it, are you stuck with that decision or can you change your mind? Now, Tyler does a great job here and he lets the guy know that he actually can revoke his consent anytime he wants, which is true, but it's somewhat nuanced. You can, in fact, revoke consent whenever you want, but you have to understand what the purpose of consent is and when it might be too late. So let's take a look at a little graphic that I created here. So we have this little curvy road here and we start up here at the top where it says initiation. And that's where you first make contact with the police officer. And you'll notice there's like a little search warrant icon down there and the road curves. And that is to illustrate the fact that all the officers are trying to do is get around the Fourth Amendment's warrant requirement in order to search your vehicle. So you start with the fundamental premise of the Fourth Amendment, and that is that all warrantless searches are presumptively unreasonable. And then you have to consider what the exceptions to that rule are. And as you can see, we have a cluster of cars here that are driving down this curvy road, and they provide for some of the exceptions. And some of them that you might recognize are exceptions like exigent circumstances and probable cause and plain view doctrine, search incident to a lawful arrest or SELA, and then you have consent. Now, we can explore other stuff in other videos, but the whole point is that all of these exceptions are basically vehicles the police can use to get around having to get a warrant to search something. So consent is just one of those vehicles, and it's the easiest to get because they don't have to articulate their reasons to anyone. All they have to do is to get the driver's consent, and that's all they need. That is, until one of two things happens. Either one, the driver revokes their consent, or two, they use the driver's consent long enough to arrive at some other exception to the warrant requirement. So picture consent like if the police were like hitchhiking and you decided to give them a ride. So you see where the arrow is pointing up here. Maybe shortly after the initiation, you see the officer and you decide to pick him up on the side of the road and you're going to give him a ride to where he wants to go. Now he, without you knowing it, wants to take you from the initial contact back here at the front all the way down to arrest. And again, you don't know that because you're just being nice, but their goal was to uncover evidence of a crime. I mean, why else would they be searching? So they want to get you to drive both of y'all all the way down to where you can be arrested. So that's kind of like you stopping in the middle of the road and kicking the officer out in the middle of the free ride and saying, here, get out of here, right? So we're pointing an arrow here in the middle of the road and somewhere between the initial contact and the arrest, you say, whoa, 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 I'm revoking my consent. Boom, you're kicking the officer out. You're no longer giving him a ride. But again, anytime you give someone a ride, you pick them up and start to take them somewhere, and this applies to all instances of life where you can think about this, especially someone who has ulterior motives, you are in danger, whether you realize it or not. So while it's true that you can kick the officer out anytime you want to, it won't do you much good if you've already given them a ride all the way to your arrest, or if you've taken them to a place where they can use another exception to the warrant requirement to continue the search, even after you revoke your consent. For example, let's say this auditor isn't there. The cop makes it to the center console based on the guy's consent. And once he leans over the center console, he sees a baggie of a crystalline substance that he suspects to be meth. So at this point, the driver can revoke his consent all day long, but it doesn't matter because now this officer has seen something in plain view that would give him probable cause to search. So he's exception hopped his way from consent over to plain view and then over to probable cause. Plain view, remember, is an exception to the warrant requirement that allows officers to seize evidence that they see in plain view if certain elements are met. There are three of them specifically. Number one, they have to see the thing that they saw from a lawful vantage point. So if you open the door for them or you gave them consent to be in your car, then they meet that element. So the second element is they have to have a lawful right of access to the thing to be seized. Now again, if you give them consent on a car search or something, that's fine. They have a lawful right of access, just like they have a lawful vantage point, because they're both based on consent. But let's say that's not the fact pattern. Let's say they're looking from, say, a public road into your window. So they can see it from a lawful vantage point, but they don't have a lawful right of access to it because they'd have to actually go into your house in order to get it and they can't go into your house without a warrant or consent. So the best they can do is like use the information that they see from a lawful vantage point and hope that a judge would see that as enough of probable cause to grant a search warrant. But let's say they just walked up to your front door and asked for consent. Well, unless you have like no trespassing signs or something like that that would lead the police to believe that they can't approach your front door, if they approach, knock, do a knock and talk and ask for consent to come in and look and you let them, then they've got all three elements. 
The third element is that it has to be immediately apparent to the officer that the thing that they're seizing is illegal. And so again, in our example, leaning over the center console, you have permission to be there, you have a lawful right of access, and you immediately notice a crystalline substance that you can articulate as what you believe to be cocaine or meth. So that satisfies all the elements that they need in order to continue to search because they've established from plain view probable cause to continue that search and possibly to make an arrest depending on what happens next. So it's just important that you understand how this stuff operates and to be careful about what you tell the police they can and can't do. It's important to note that most of the evidence people get convicted on actually comes from them in some shape, form, or fashion, which is why I always say keep your evidence to yourself because you mostly prosecute yourself when it comes to this stuff. So the moral of the story is never ever consent to a search. Hell, I think you should decline consent in every situation if for no other reason other than the fact that the cops will just leave your whole shit in disarray and let you clean up the mess they just made. I mean, think about that for a second. Let's say your buddy dropped his cell phone in your car and he comes over to your house, knocks on the door and says, hey man, I think I dropped my phone in your car. Would you mind if I look through your car to see if I can find it? You'd let him because he's your friend and then as he moves things around and goes through your car and looks for stuff, whatever mess he makes, he's gonna clean up because there's like this common courtesy or friendship between the two of you where, you know, it's like a gentleman's agreement. If I mess up your stuff, I'm gonna clean it. The police don't do that. When have you ever seen the cops deliver on the same courtesy when they search somebody's car? No, they're like, thanks sucker, clean up our mess and stay out of our town. You know, no thank you. That's part of the problem with community relations with police officers is they don't really, they're, they don't really know how to act. You know, they, they don't understand how to act civilized with people and that's why we see the videos that we see because they get a lot of like officers who just don't know how to conduct themselves like a normal person. You catch a lot more flies with honey than you do vinegar. I know you've heard that saying a bunch of times and it's lost on police officers. In closing, I hadn't heard of Tyler's channel before. I just happened to see a video where he did an audit of a local county and I really liked his approach to auditing. Now, I haven't seen him post anything recently, so I really hope he hasn't decided to hang it up. I think the world needs even-tempered people to do that type of work, and I think he had a great approach to it. And I really look forward to seeing if he posts more stuff about his work in the future. Now, to be clear, I'm not suggesting that the cops did anything illegal here. In fact, I think, all things considered, they handled it pretty well. You and I may take issue with the tactics or maybe we'll roll our eyes at the absurdity of the war on drugs and the relative good it's done compared to the harm that it's done over the years. And we might actually be offended by sort of the profiling part of it. If we think that they got him out of the car because they assumed he had dope because he was black, that might bother you and I get that and you wouldn't be wrong for that. But as far as the law goes, the officers conducted themselves within their legal boundaries. They can ask for consent from anyone they want. They can legally stop people for pretextual reasons, and the courts have said as long as they have an actual recognizable criminal infraction or traffic infraction to make the stop, whether or not they had a pretextual reason for stopping them does not matter. So here, the guy had expired tags for several months, so legally they had a reason to stop him. Now, I'd actually prefer that when challenged, officers do what these guys did and just bail on the stop as opposed to what we see a lot of times where these police officers will get in their feelings and let their ego cause them to double down on some nonsense and the situation escalates into something that is completely unnecessary and that it doesn't have to be. So overall, they did a decent job handling this and not letting it get out of hand. They didn't go after the auditor and they let the guy go without giving him a ticket. So, you know, overall, not a bad interaction with police. However, you can't convince me that had Tyler not been there with his camera, that this dude would not have been out there a very long time and had his car torn apart for him to clean up before he could get back onto North Carolina. Anyway, that's all for this one, guys. Thanks for watching. Please remember to like and subscribe and leave a comment on the video. Check out some of the other videos on the channel and leave a comment on there as well. Until I see you again, take care. Always film your interactions with the police and keep your evidence to yourself.